Good afternoon and welcome to PVA's webinar on voting during a pandemic. We will be starting momentarily. Good afternoon and welcome again to uh, Paralyzed Veterans of America's webinar this afternoon on voting during a pandemic. My name is Heather Ansley and I'm the Associate Executive Director of Government Relations for PVA and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, we wanted to remind everyone that if you have any questions during this presentation, please use the Q&A control on your screen to post those. Uh, we will answer all questions at the end of the presentation. We also wanted to uh, let you know that this event is being recorded today um, and it will be uh, posted on PBA's website um, in the near future. So today we have with us uh, two uh, great presenters who have a wealth of knowledge um, about voting. First is Lee Page. He's our Senior Associate Advocacy Director here at PVA. Uh, Lee has been, uh, for over 30 years, he has worked to ensure the rights of people with disabilities by advocating for the removal of regulatory and discriminatory barriers through interaction with the Congress, the administration, and federal agencies, and of course, other disability organizations, private businesses, and the general public. His expertise is in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and with the Air Carrier Access Act and also voting rights laws for people with disabilities. Our second presenter today is Jack Rosen. Jack is a voter engagement specialist with the National Disability Rights Network. Jack develops nonpartisan messaging to engage and increase participation of voters with disabilities in the electoral process. He collaborates with civil and disability rights organizations to enhance voter engagement nationally. Prior to joining NDRN in May of 2020, Jack helped to implement voter contact strategies for a state Senate campaign and worked as a freelance strategic communications consultant. He holds a BA in government from Skidmore College and a Master's of Arts in American Government from Georgetown University. I'd now like to turn it over to Lee Page, who's going to begin our presentation today. Okay, can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. Uh, we've got uh, a presentation overview. Some of the things we're going to talk about today is planning your vote, uh, some special considerations for voters with disabilities, and then uh, National Disability Rights Network, NDRN, Voter Engagement Program that Jack will talk about. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. How to plan your vote. Uh, when, when it comes to planning your vote, there are a few things you might want to consider uh, before you get, as you get started. First of all, A, are you registered? Uh, B, how do you want to vote? And C, where do you get your information about voting? So um, first of all, uh, everyone, the Constitution guarantees your right to vote if you're 18 years or older and a citizen of the United States. But first of all, you have to be registered to vote. Uh, the simple and easiest place to get registered is at your local DMV, your Division of Motor Vehicles, um, or State Disability Service Offices, or the National Voter Registration Application Process. Um, the, back in 1993, when the uh, National Voter Registration Act passed, all those applications became applicable. 
the other issue is how do you want to vote? Uh, two choices are vote by mail or in person. If you vote by mail, you have to uh, request an absentee ballot uh, and you have to do so, do so uh, before the state deadline. Uh, in person voting, you've got a choice of early voting or, uh, and that's at the polls or at the polls on election day, which is uh, November 3rd. So, and then the other question is, where can you get some preliminary information ahead of time about voting uh, that can assist you? And we've got two websites that we think are pretty good. One is the US Election Assistance Commission or the EAC. And then of course there's PVA, uh, our, our, own web, our own website, pva.org. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. So how do, how, do, how do you register to vote? As I mentioned, uh, the easiest way is to fill out the National Voter Registration Form. Uh, it's right there at vote.org backslash register to vote. And you can click on that, um, fill it out, and then make sure you print it. And then once it's printed, you sign and date the form, which is very important, uh, and then mail or hand deliver it uh, to the appropriate address. Uh, make sure you complete the registration prior to the state's deadline, though. Next slide. So, yeah, there you go. If you're going to vote in person, uh, make sure you take into fact, uh, you know, the pandemic and some COVID-19 safety requirements. Uh, first of all, Poll workers, depending on state requirements, will be wearing personal protective equipment, PPE, such as gloves or face coverings. Uh, voters will be encouraged to wear masks and face coverings to ensure uh, decrease the spread of the virus, spread of the virus. And then social distancing will be promoted at the polls uh, by voters standing at least six feet apart in lines inside and out of the polls. This includes proper space for a wheelchair user. And then polling places should be reconfigured in order to adhere to social distancing protocol. Basically, you'll have additional space between the voting booths, poll workers, and voters standing in line. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so early voting uh, is already taking place. There are 40 states that have enacted voting, uh, early voting for this uh, 2020 general election. And as I say, uh, it's already started. Uh, in mid-September uh, or 45 days ahead of the election in some states, um, all the way up till Friday before the election are some of the early times. Uh, early voting typically ends uh, the day before the election uh, but it varies in different states. Uh, here in the state of Virginia, where I live, early voting started on September 18th and will end on Friday, that October 31st, right before uh, the general election on that next Tuesday. Uh, 24 states and the district also allow voting early on the weekends, which would be on a Saturdays also. Next slide. So vote by mail. Uh, that's one of the choices you have. Uh, to do so, the post office, the United Postal Service, recommends that the voter request your ballot as early as possible. So once you know you're going to vote by mail, uh, and once uh, the time slot comes up for you to request that ballot, do so as quickly as possible. Uh, no later than 15 days prior to the election. Once you receive it at home, uh, fill it out as quick as possible and then put it back in the mail. Uh, that way you get it, it gets back to, uh, to be counted. Uh, do it, you know, at least no more at the latest seven days before the election. Plus, make sure you've got a first class stamp on the, uh, on the envelope to ensure that it gets back uh, as quick as possible. Um, some state and local uh, officials might have prepaid postage, but that's not a guarantee. 
And if you need more information about, you know, utilizing uh, the postal service, you can go to ups.com uh, backslash voting info. Okay, next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, we were talking about the Election Assistance Commission. The EAC was established by the Help America Vote Act. It's an independent bipartisan commission charged with helping Americans vote. Uh, they do this by adopting voluntary voting system guidelines and serving as a national clearinghouse for information on the election administration. EAC also accredits testing laboratories and certifies voting machines and is responsible for the national voter registration form. It's very important that they, they are the testing lab and certify voting machines because all voting machines in each jurisdiction and state have to be certified. Uh, a lot of times you'll see that uh, all the states don't necessarily vote on the exact same voting machine. Uh, it's up to each local jurisdiction to purchase whichever machine uh, they want to vote on, but they all have to be certified uh, through the EAC. Next slide. Uh, and here we have the EAC website, uh, eac.gov, and we'll go to that website right, right now to uh, look at some of the issues uh, that I'd like to explain <laughs> that will make it uh, easier to, uh, as I see, this is the main page. Um, you've got a list over here on the left, some information about the coronavirus, but up here at the top you see if you need help, you click on the down arrow and um, it'll give you a choice of who you are, which you are a voter, so you click on voter. Uh, over there it says what do you want to do. You've got a list of four or five things that you can do as a voter. Down at the bottom, it says find where to vote, which is basically where is my polling place. So we'll click on that and push enter. And then that will take us to an interactive page that shows the states and registration. But if we click over here to the right, where it says registration vote in your state, that'll take you uh, to a, a nice uh, uh, spot, an arrow where you can click on uh, the state that you're in. I live in uh, Virginia, of course, and so we'll test it with Virginia. File down and click on that. It says get Virginia info. And uh, when you click on that, the information that comes up is uh, you've got some 800 numbers, an 804 local number. Uh, you see the registration deadline date of October 13th. Election day is November 3rd. Um, and so that's good information. You can click on polling place lookup right there because that's what we're trying to find is where is our local polling place. That switches you to the, to, uh, the Department of Elections for the state of Virginia. You push go at the bottom of the, uh, the slide to get to the next website. In the middle is find your polling place, which you click on there. And that'll take you to uh, a website where you fill in your name, uh, you know, your first name, your last name, your date of birth, your four uh, last social security numbers. And then you choose the locality uh, in which you live, um, which for me is Fairfax County, and then you go and submit that information, and what comes up is, hmm, that's not supposed to come up. Yeah, what comes up is the information, yes, my voter history. Uh, my name, my voter number, my status, when I registered, uh, all that type of information. Uh, it says here, uh, Skyline is the precinct in Fairfax County. And I think if you scroll further down, you can see 
polling place. There it is. It says, um, my polling place is at Sk Three Skyline Place. It shows the address for the, for the uh, polling place. It says, yes, it is ADA compliant. Um, ADA comments, it says compliant. Accessibility restrictions, there are no restrictions found. So that's, um, that's a great tool. Uh, that way you know that um, for that question, if you needed to find if polling places were accessible, uh, you could flip over to EAC and search through their webpage and, and find out uh, the accessibility factor um, for the polling place. And there's a whole list of other issues uh, that you could find there also. Next slide. Some of the frequently asked questions, um, you know, that people have that you can find out <clears throat> at, that, at that website are, you know, when is the next election? What are the, <clears throat> pardon me, what are the hours for the polling polls open? Where can I register to vote? Do I register by political party? What are acceptable forms of ID? And then how do I file a complaint? So that's a lot of good info off of the, the EAC website. Next slide. Uh, the other website we were talking about, of course, is PVA's website. Uh, PVA has a dedicated website for voting this year at pva.org backslash vote. We've got uh, the accessible voting checklist and we've got the state laws governing early voting as an interactive website. So why don't we go to that website and we'll check out um, what it looks like. Um, as you know, it's PVA's website, but um, it's also a dedicated web page for accessible voting. Um, as you scr scroll down, you can see the quick links that'll take you to state laws governing early voting. And if you click on that, there they are. You've got all the states um, and that'll tell you, uh, like look at Alaska, it says early voting begins 15 days before the election, early voting ends the day of the election, uh, locations for early voting are in the supervisor's office and the hours vary uh, by the day. And you can cruise down that whole list of all 50 states and it'll tell you uh, the different times, the different days, um, and all the locations uh, in which that you can, um, you know, do early voting. It's a great um, way to get ahead of it. The next uh, issue is the checklist. Uh, PVA put together, and that's an interactive map right there. PVA put a, put together a great uh, accessible voting checklist um, that um, that we can look at. Here, um, as it says, it's a great. Uh, you can print this out and take it with you. Uh, your accessible voting checklist, and it's got a, a whole bunch of good questions on it. Reminders like register to vote. Think about what your needs are. You know, learn your options of you know vote in person or vote by mail again. Um, you know, consider the deadlines uh, and don't wait. Of course, once you learn how to learn what you want to do, make sure you cast your ballot. And then, if you're voting in person, you know you could always do a trial run. Uh, you know, visit your polling place ahead of time especially uh, remember what your, what your needs are. You know, say um, you, for those of you who are driving to the polling place, wheelchair users need accessible parking. You know, what's the path of travel to get to the polling place? Is it accessible? Is the entrance to the facility accessible? You know, the, the entrance might not necessarily be, uh, for voting might not necessarily be the main entrance to the building hopefully signages will be available. So let's see what the next slide is after that. And um, yeah, we have PVA's voting resources, the accessible voting checklist, which I just talked about some of the things, you know, you can uh, uh, 
you know, learn your voting options. Don't wait. Vote in person. You can do a trial run, like I said. You know, if you need assistance, you can bring a friend uh, who can assist you uh, in the poll. And then, of course, the big issue is know your rights. Uh, ADA requires polling places to be accessible, and the Help America Vote Act requires the independent and secure ballot. Next slide. And the big deal is rights of voters with people with disabilities. As a voter with a disability, you have a right to vote privately and independently, have an accessible polling place, access to electronic voting machine, have an individual of your choice, as I just mentioned, accompany you into the poll to assist you if necessary, and then, of course, use curbside voting as an option. All these rights were uh, guaranteed by the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, the Help America Vote Act, and the old uh, Elderly and Handicapped Voting Act of 1984. So with that, um, I think I'll, my, I will turn it over to Jack and let him uh, talk about uh, his program. Go ahead, Thank Jack. you. Thank you, Lee, and thank you for having me here today. First, I'd like to talk a little about the structure of NDRN and how we function before I go more in depth about how we are helping engage and protect the rights of voters this election. Um, the first thing to understand is that NDRN is a membership association. We represent the individuals who make up the protection and advocacy network. As such, we advocate both behalf uh, on behalf of the PA staff, as well as for individuals with disabilities. Um, a little about the PA network. The PA network is simultaneously federally mandated and largely independent. It traces back to the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act of 1975. There is a PA for every state, U.S. territory, uh, the District of Columbia, and one focused on the Native American community, predominantly in the Four Corners region of the United States. Um, well, there are a few exceptions where they've become a part of state government, the vast majority of PNAs are independent nonprofit entities. Uh, this means that I don't provide direct instructions to the network, but rather training and support. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So what does the network do? Well, they do a lot to protect and advocate for the rights of people with disabilities, and much of their work is more at the systemic level. One important thing they do is surveying polling places to make sure they meet ADA standards. We're currently working to expand those efforts, by the way, and um, with an app, um, they also work with election administrators to encourage and ensure accessible voting. For instance, uh, just today I was talking to one state PNA who has been pressuring their, sta their state's secretary of state to ensure that poll workers are properly trained in the use of accessible voting equipment because this cycle they have a new accessible voting machine that they'll be using. Um, they also alert election administrators when current practices fall short. Sometimes this is just issuing them a reminder that they need to improve. Sometimes they need to be a bit firmer and other times they need to use the power of the legal system, filing DOJ complaints on behalf of voters who have had uh, their rights restricted by a lack of accessible voting equipment or a lack of an accessible polling place. Um, interestingly, as I understand it, they actually cannot use the funding they receive, though, under the Help America Vote Act to launch those lawsuits. Um, one example where litigation was required was in a number of states where they needed to force them to provide an accessible mail-in ballot for those who are blind or have limited vision, as well as those with certain print disabilities. 
They also work with other groups on the ground in their states, such as those who run congregate settings to ensure that voters in those settings are fully informed of their rights and are able to exercise uh, their right to vote. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? The PNA network also does do work with individual voters. One uh, great example of that is helping voters who have lost their right to vote due to guardianship have their rights restored. Um, what that can look like can vary significantly. In an ideal case, it's pretty straightforward when the individual expresses a clear desire to vote their guardian supports their wish to have their voting rights restored, and the judge can issue a quick ruling restoring voting rights. Sometimes it can get a bit trickier depending on the positions of the guardian or the judge, as well as how state law is written. Another area where they directly help voters is in figuring out what accommodations they are entitled to at the polling place. For instance, uh, what how much of a right they have to bring in a service animal which is generally defined as a dog or miniature horse to the polling place uh, however in most jurisdictions they may need to inform a voter that they do not have the right to bring an emotional support animal to the polling place or a service animal that's not a dog or miniature horse um, another example might be informing voters what accessible options are available in their state. Um, for instance, uh, what accessible machines are offered, um, how widespread, even though it's required, how easily available things like large print ballots are, or what other options they may have. Um, I know in Arizona, they launched a pilot program, for instance, to do a more accessible form of a digital voter registration. And finally, another way that the network is directly helping voters is that we at NDRN have partnered with Lyft to provide free accessible rides to voters who need them. And the PNA network is distributing uh, ride codes to the individuals they work with who need a free accessible ride. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So now that we are, so now that we've covered uh, that, what do we do to support the network? In addition to finding opportunities like partnering with Lyft, we do a variety of other things. Chief among them is that we provide trainings and technical assistance to the PNA network. Uh, these days, that means a lot of webinars. And as we get closer to the election, um, we try to inject reminding people of the importance of voting and getting out the disability vote, even into webinars with non-voting PNA staff. For recently, I addressed staff members who work on PAMI, that's um, protection advocacy for those with mental illness to remind them of all the ways they can encourage the individuals they work with to vote. Um, but most of those webinars are more traditional and feature things like myself and Michelle Bishop doing trainings to update the network on the rights of voters and recent changes in the law impacting those rights, as well as to get them up to speed on best practices surrounding voter engagement. We also do other things like testify to Congress on the importance of removing bar barriers to accessible voting, partner with organizations to promote getting out the vote and best accessibility practices. And then finally, in addition to the trainings, we work to provide the network with the resources they need, which brings us a bit more to what I do and um, our next slide, please. This year, I was brought on to help expand our voter engagement efforts. A lot of that has entailed our series of voting videos. Um, now, these videos were created with the purpose of creating the representation 
of voters with disabilities that, to be honest, is quite often lacking in mainstream get out the vote campaigns. Because a lot of efforts, as I'm sure you've seen, barely feature people with disabilities. And when it does, maybe it's a quick shot of a woman in a wheelchair saying, I'm going to vote. But it doesn't necessarily engage voters with disabilities in a way that specifically connects to their disability and why it's important for people with disabilities to vote. So we've kind of tried to create content to fill that gap by interviewing voters with disabilities about what issues motivate them to vote, often ones connected to um, their status or condition. Um, we've done videos on everything from improving access to healthcare to an upcoming one about the rights of individuals with disabilities to enjoy outdoor recreation and hunting. Um, also, as a fun aside, one of the very first videos we did in this series was done in partnership with uh, PVA and Lee here helped um, me bring that together. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? All of these stories, as well as other resources, are housed on our new microsite that we launched, which is www.voterswithdisabilities.org. Uh, we're going to add additional resources beyond voter stories to that website as time goes on. But right now, the focus is really on getting these stories out so that we can motivate people to participate in the electoral process over the next uh, 27 days. We also partner with outside groups to try to encourage civic participation. This year, we partnered with National Voter Registration Week, Vote Early Day, and Power at the Polls, which is an organization aimed at recruiting poll workers. We support these efforts with everything from webinars for our network to creating content designed specifically to boost these goals. Uh, one example is we did a video with a woman with a disability who served as a poll worker to try to encourage other individuals with disabilities to participate as poll workers as well. And finally, and this ties back to providing resources for our network, uh, this year we released a social media toolkit to help our PNAs have the content they need to carry them through election day, as well as to connect them with uh, election protection resources. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So that is a bit about what NDRN has been doing to help protect the rights of voters with disabilities and to help get them to the polls this November. If you need help exercising your right to vote, need to find out if we offer free accessible rides in your area, or have any questions about what accommodations are available in your state, you can contact your state and territories uh, PA at the link in my slide. And uh, that wraps things up for me. Thank you, Jack, uh, for your uh, presentation and Lee uh, for going over all of that great information about um, how uh, voters with disabilities can access the polls, uh, particularly uh, during a pandemic. Uh, so we do have time for uh, questions uh, on your uh, screen. You will see a box that says Q&A. You can type in any uh, questions that you have there um, and we will uh, have our presenters uh, address them. Uh, we do have a, a, a few questions that we'll get started with. And Lee, this first question is for you. Um, is, the question is, can you request curbside voting? And maybe you could just tell us in general a little bit more about curbside voting. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, curbside voting is an option uh, that originally came about uh, with the 1984 law uh, that passed for the elderly and handicapped. Uh, it was originally uh, an accommodation because of polling places not being ex physically accessible. Um, however, uh, ADA requires polling places to be accessible. Uh, curbside voting is still offered 
to anyone uh, who gets to the poll and wants to utilize curbside voting. Uh, a lot of times, and in, in, in that fashion, the poll worker will bring the ballot uh, to you uh, at the curb. Uh, and that's literally, uh, you know, it's, it's historically, it's for people who can't get out of their car who, who can come in the poll. It, it's not required that you stay in your car to utilize this form of voting. Uh, you can actually stand out on the sidewalk um, and have the ballot out there also. Um, the reality is um, we're in the pandemic of COVID-19 um, and curbside voting may be expanded uh, more during this, uh, this election. As you know, uh, uh, there's been lots of talk whether we'll have enough poll workers, uh, whether polling places will be relocated, or whether polling places might go to a, a voting center or what have you. So there are a lot of uh, issues and options out there. Curbside voting um, is still a viable option for someone who doesn't want to put themselves at risk by necessarily going into the poll. Um, so I guess that's a little short synopsis of what that's about. Thank you, Lee. Uh, the next question is for uh, Jack. Um, Jack, what do you do if you uh, run into accessibility barriers um, when you're voting? That's a good question. Um, there are two things you can do. One uh, is contact your P&A. Um, I believe all of them run hotlines on election day and some of those uh, open up sooner than election day for early voting to try to deal with any issues you're having. In addition, you should contact the election protection hotline at 1-866-R-VOTE. That's 1-866-R-VOTE to report any inaccessible polling places or attempts to not let you uh, cast your ballot. If for some reason, let's say they say you don't have the right ID or you get to the polling place and they tell you, oh, your polling place has changed this year, you gotta go wherever, you can also request a provisional ballot. And if you are registered to vote, uh, your vote will still be able to count. Thank you, Jack. Um, we have a, another question. Have there been any uh, COVID-related issues that have come up that maybe we've seen in the primaries that have impacted uh, voting for people with disabilities? And, and Jack, we'll start with you, and then Lee, if you have anything to, you just hop in uh, with Jack. Um, you know, that's an interesting question. And the answer is sort of yes and no. In a lot of ways, it has exacerbated um, the problems that voters with disabilities were already facing. I mean, you know, we always see long lines on election day that it might be hard for someone with mobility issues or this year, let's say, a compromised immune system to uh, be in for hours. And this year with polling places being consolidated, you know, that's a real concern. Um, one somewhat unique problem, though I won't say completely original, that it has caused this year, though, is that um, originally there was this expectation that there would be a shortage of poll workers. Um, thanks to Power at the Polls and other groups, that may not be the case this year, fortunately. But still, um, a lot of poll workers are generally older folks and a lot of the people who are traditionally poll workers won't be serving as them this year. As a result, there's gonna be a lot of first time poll workers and that means people who it's their first time working with accessible voting equipment or being familiar with the rights of voters with disabilities. So um, perhaps the biggest unique challenge it's posed is that we're gonna have a lot more um, I won't say untrained, but less experienced poll workers than we have in the past. Yeah, <clears throat> and the only thing that I could say is, 
as Jack mentioned, uh, during the primaries, the, the two that really stuck out were Georgia and I think uh, either Michigan or Wisconsin, where it was uh, it, the, um, the preparations were not really done ahead of time. And you had lines, you know, just extremely long lines and people were not necessarily utilizing social distancing. And some of them did wear uh, masks or PPE. And the, re and the reality is you just need to ensure your own self, you know, to be safe during this whole uh, exercise. Uh, because if you are gonna go vote at the polls and vote in person, uh, make sure that you, uh, you know, it, ensure your safety first, which is wear a mask uh, and make sure you social distance from either people in front of you or in the line or even inside the polling place. Uh, that way, um, you know, you can exercise your right to vote in a safe and secure environment. Thanks, Jack and Lee. Um, as voters uh, with, with disabilities uh, think about their, uh, their plans, what is the most important thing that you can, uh, you can do if you do plan to vote in person this year at the polling place? And Lee, could you maybe start? Yes, yeah, say it again. Just one more time, I missed the first part. So if you are a person with a disability and you're thinking about uh, voting uh, in person this year, uh, what is the, some of the most important things that you can do to make sure that you can uh, be able to successfully vote on election day? Yeah, well, first of all is make sure you know where your polling place is. Um, you know, they may have changed since the last time you voted. Um, you, know, you know, take your time. It's gonna be, uh, if your state has early voting, I suggest go uh, and vote early before election day. Um, you know, those, uh, the, the map that we showed on the PVA website tells you uh, which states have early voting. Uh, and then you can also find your poll if you don't know where it is. But then, uh, yeah, go early if you have that option. If not, go on election day and, and there again, go, uh, Make sure you have abundant amount of time because there may be long lines. Uh, you know, the other thing you'll need is if you're driving, accessible parking. Make sure you have a, a good path of travel to get to the poll. Uh, polling places in 2020 should all be accessible now. Uh, and they should also have an accessible parking. Uh, but the reality is, you know, even though they provide accessible parking, it's not necessarily going to be like the parking you may be used to because you're, they're utilizing, um, you know, their make a space parking spaces. They might not necessarily have the adequate a number of accessible spaces. And so they might put orange cones out to make spaces. And uh, the, the lot might be sloped. And the other reality is, um, you're not, it, it's not a reserved space. There are lots of uh, other people who may, who may want to utilize that space also. I remember the last time I voted, I had to come back a couple of times to get the space. So, uh, but then also ensure the path of travel to the front. Uh, and then, you know, then there's the option of curbside voting if you want to, if you want to do that also. So, um, those are just some of the things you might want to Put in your plan or consider what you need to do, you know, taking a cause and effect of your disability per se. If you need, uh, you've got stamina issues, take some food, take some water, uh, you know, take whatever you need to, to stay healthy and energetic. Um, you know, while you're standing in line, um, uh, if you need assistance, take a friend. If that person needs to sit down in a chair uh, and then you know, they can request a, a chair uh, from within the poll to assist them also. So those are just some of the issues. Thanks, Lee. We have several uh, resources that we wanted to make uh, attendees aware of. 
Um, and Lee, I'll, I'll just call on you if maybe you could briefly just go through some of the resource websites we have available. Sure. At the top is the EAC uh, website, like I said, the Election Assistance Commission. You also got uh, PVA's voting and ADA resources. Uh, the pva.org uh, backslash vote takes you to the uh, website that we looked at that had the uh, early, uh, the you know, the website that had the early uh, vote centers and re registration links to that, which is a great resource. Uh, the pva.org ADA uh, website has the polling place checklist, which is part of the Department of Justice, which is a great guide on what an accessible polling place looks like. Um, and then you've got U.S. Vote Foundation, which is another um, a good website for registration and other uh, voting information. National Conference of State Legislators, their website, and then the Early Vote Center uh, website also. All of these websites will tell you, um, you know, A, how to get registered, uh, B, um, you know, where your polling place is and what the hours of operation uh, for the polling place uh, per state and jurisdiction and sometimes. So uh, these are good resources. Uh, check them out if you need some more information. Thanks, Lee. We have a, another question that's come in. I'd like to uh, present this to our uh, presenters. Um, so accessible parking is usually in the front of the building. And the question is, what can we do if uh, that is used for extending lines out for the elections and then there's reduced or limited parking because of this? So basically, if people are standing in the accessible parking area, um, what can be done to make sure that, uh, what should you do as a voter to make sure that the accessible parking spaces is, is actually available to folks who need it? Right. Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, the polling places are required uh, to be accessible now, uh, and that includes parking and a path of travel to the entrance um, and then throughout the polling site to actually cast your ballot. So um, in theory, that's what is supposed to happen. Um, I mean, Jack, maybe you could say if they don't well, abide by that, how do you file the complaint? Yeah, I mean, I think as much as possible, your first uh, recourse there might be to call your local board of elections, be like, hey, I'm at the polling place at Smith Middle School. I, you need to have the people who work here deal with this. I can't get into the accessible uh, parking spot. And hopefully that is the end of it. But if not, that is definitely an instance where you want to call your PNA because the network, um, that, that is a situation, you know, where your legal right to vote is being infringed upon. So you would definitely want to contact your PNA if you can't get that resolved with something as simple as calling your local board of elections or flagging down a poll worker and being like, I need people to clear out of this spot. Thanks, Lee and Jack. We have another uh, question that has come up about uh, veterans, uh, VA nursing homes, how they are gonna be able to vote this year. I know there's been a broader issue of how people uh, in nursing homes in general be, will be able to vote, particularly because of COVID and the uh, restrictions on uh, visitors. Um, I will uh, take the first part on, on the VA process to say that uh, the VA put out a directive uh, in October of 2019 uh, that lays out very clearly um, assist voting assistance uh, for our veterans who are in VA nursing homes and also inpatients um, that would require the volunteer services um, at facilities and social workers to work together to be able to assist veterans who, who need to register and or to uh, cast their ballot. Um, of course, uh, they, like others, have, have depended upon volunteers to assist. 
Uh, PVA has reached out to VA. They are aware, of course, that volunteers are are have limited access these days to both uh, the spinal cord injury units and to nursing home, the VA nursing homes, and uh, they are working to ensure that VA social workers uh, work with the voluntary service staff uh, to be able to to fill in those gaps. Uh, so that those um, issues have been raised and we have alerted our chapters uh, about the information that's out there uh, within the VA. Uh, so, so we know that that is something that, that VA is able to, to perhaps address a little more easily. Uh, but I know this has also been an issue of concern in, in civilian nursing homes, and certainly we have veterans in civilian nursing homes as well as a lot of other people. Uh, with disabilities. Uh, so, so Jack, maybe you could talk to us about um, what, what's being done to try to make sure folks that are in those settings, particularly in, during the time of a pandemic, are also able to vote. Um, you know, it's fairly similar to the process you described here with the VA. You know, our state PNAs have been working with everyone from, you know, their state Department of Health to the trade associate, at least in one state, to the trade association for nursing home providers to make sure they're aware of the rights of folks with disabilities to vote and what their obligations are uh, during this. I will admit this definitely has been an area that's a bit of a challenge. Um, you asked earlier if there had been any kind of novel challenges that it had arose because of COVID. And I should adjust my answer because this is probably the one that really has emerged. It's the, it is difficult um, with all the safety restrictions in place. So as much as possible, we are just, you know, letting our network know and ha having them let, you know, the those on the ground in their states know, you know, these are their rights. This is ways in which you can assist a voter. You know, um, you can't bar people from necessarily leaving if they want to go vote, though then if they have to let them back into a facility after they did gets a little trickier, unfortunately. Thanks, Jack. Lee, do you have anything further to add to that? No, no um, uh, all of the above is is good answer. Well, great. Well, I want to thank uh, both Lee and Jack for taking the time to talk with us today about voting um, access. We did record today's webinar and it will be available along with the PowerPoint slides on, on pba.org um, in the coming days. Uh, we will also uh, send this to those of you who were able to attend today uh, so that you'll have access to the great resources and information. Um, also, feel free to reach out directly to Lee or to Jack if you have any additional questions that come up or things that you didn't get uh, answered that you'd like to discuss, and, and we would be uh, happy to, to assist you. Uh, so this concludes today's webinar. Again, thank you for joining us, and uh, uh, now I guess the word would be to, to go vote. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day.